Welcome to the Earthkeeper Stargate program. My name is James Tipperon, and I am the host of today's interview with the amazing Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock is the British author of major international bestsellers, including The Sign and the Seal, Fingerprints of the Gods, and Heaven's Mirror. His books have sold more than 12 million copies worldwide. Graham will be a featured speaker at the Earthkeeper Colorado Stargate event in Denver, Colorado, May 29th through June 1st, 2015. Welcome, Graham. Graham, you've been working on your new book. I believe the title will be The Magician of the Gods. Yes, that's right. Um, I've been working on this book for about two and a half years now. Extensive travels and research and I've now just completed the writing of the book, at least to the stage of a first draft. I'm working through that a substantial draft and, and making corrections and additions and, and changes, but, but basically I've, I've got it done. And this is a, a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. Now, I published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995, so we're 20 years later. The reason I'm doing a, a new book is actually not because of the anniversary of the 20th anniversary of Fingerprints of the Gods, although that is a happy coincidence. But because in these 20 years, there have been, and particularly in the last 10 years, there have been extraordinary developments relating to my basic theme. And, and my basic theme is that we may be seized with amnesia, that we could have lost a whole episode, an incredibly important episode of civilization from the record uh, and that the story we tell ourselves now about ourselves missing that incredibly important chapter and it was to that end that I wrote and published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995 and what's happened really very strongly in the last 10 years uh, is that a whole lot of new evidence has come out which very strongly supports that basic hypothesis of a lost civilization and it's to bring all this new evidence before the reader uh, that I have sat down and written a completely new book it's not an update to fingerprints of the gods it's a it's a completely new book uh, but, but it's pursuing the same mystery uh, but in the light of some very recent really quite incredible uh, scientific discoveries Graham would you be able to share a few of the new discoveries that will be spoken about in your new book? Yeah, let me, let me tell you about a few, a few issues. Uh, the first, the first, the first issue is, um, is to do with the cataclysm, and that's always a difficult subject to, uh, to talk about. I, I, I don't like gloom and doom myself very much. I like to be in the light, and I, I like to spread a positive message. But uh, you can't really talk about a lost civilization you know, which vanished from the record without considering the possibility that a, cat that a cataclysm was involved. And when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods in the early 90s, as I say, it was published in 1995, I focused very much on the end of the last ice age. I focused particularly on the period between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago. And I explored a number of possible explanations for what had happened then. We, we do know that cataclysmic events occurred as those great ice sheets melted down. But it wasn't possible to really uh, propose a smoking gun. There were, there were a number of possibilities, all of which, all of which I considered uh, in, some, in some depth in that book. Uh, that there was a cataclysm seemed not to be in doubt. But what exactly was the nature of it uh, was a more complicated issue. What's happened since 2007 is that a group of scientists, mainly in the United States, but they are in fact a, a worldwide group, there's, there's more than 30 of them now, senior scientists, geophysicists, geologists, nuclear chemists, uh, very, very highly credentialed people, uh, have begun to unearth evidence that our planet was hit really badly uh, by several fragments of a giant comet. Uh, that comet in its original form would have been more than 100 kilometers 
in diameter. Uh, but the evidence suggests that we were hit by about seven or eight one to two kilometer diameter fragments of that comet. Um, this is close to an extinction level event. This is, a, this is an incredibly serious matter. Um, and it's based on absolutely rigorous science. Uh, the discovery of what are called impact proxies. Uh, for example, nanodiamonds, tiny diamonds that are caused in conditions of intense heat and, and shock. Silicious scoria droplets of melt glass, which resembles uh, the melt glass produced in atomic bomb explosions. Uh, this requires temperatures in excess of 2,000 to 2,300 degrees centigrade. A whole layer of this stuff has been found all over the world, covering 50 million square kilometers on four continents. And the evidence has been building and building and building. Now, mainstream, a lot of mainstream science and scientists hate what they call catastrophism. There's a, there's a bias in favor of uniformitarianism. That, that that is the notion that our um, that our story that that the Earth as we see it today is a good guide to how the Earth as it was in the past. And since no cataclysms are occurring today, why should we imagine that cataclysms occurred in the past? Now it was accepted with a great deal of bitter dispute uh, some decades ago. It was finally accepted that the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago was caused by a cosmic impact. In that case, uh, certainly a single object of 10, 10 kilometers in diameter and possibly one or two others as well, the main crater being in the Gulf of Mexico, the Chicxulub crater. Uh, and and uh, gradually science came around to accepting that. But what nobody's considered until recently uh, is that there could have been a much more recent event on a similar scale. And that's what this new science has now brought to the fore, to the point where I personally believe that it's beyond dispute. There are still attempts to cast doubt on this new scenario, uh, but the evidence is now so compelling, and I, I'm sharing a great deal of that evidence in the, in the new book, that we have to uh, accept the possibility, not just the possibility, the very, very strong likelihood, certainty even, uh, that we passed through uh, an extinction-level event, and it did cause the extinctions of large animal species, uh, all of them in North America went extinct at this time and in South America and across Europe as well. Uh, and humanity passed through that cataclysm and we were radically and deeply affected by it. And here's the thing. Our historians and our archaeologists have been painting a picture of our past that misses out this crucial information. They can't be blamed for missing it out because the information has only been brought to the fore in the last seven years. It's very, very recent, and most of it is in dense and very difficult to read academic papers. Uh, but when you look at this information in depth, as I have, uh, it leaves you in no doubt whatsoever that 12,800 years ago, which is exactly the time that I indicated in Fingerprints of the Gods, for the cataclysm that lost us a whole civilization, our planet passed through the most horrendous series of disasters, which resulted in massive flooding. One of the research trips I made was across uh, Oregon and Washington states in the U.S., looking at what are called the channeled scablands there, and the unbelievable devastation, which up till now has been thought to have been caused by repeated floods from glacial lakes, it's now becoming clear that there was one gigantic, humongous flood. And that flood resulted from the massive amount of heat that was generated when several of these comet fragments, again, a kilometer or two kilometers in diameter, hit the North American ice cap. The North American ice cap was two to three kilometers deep at that time. And that's why we don't see much in the way of craters, because the craters were caused in the ice cap itself. They instantly liquidized the ice cap, unleashed horrendous floods that tore across the North American landscape and dumped just oceans of water uh, into the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans and uh, affected global climate dramatically, plunging the Earth into an 
after an initial period of heating up and, and uh, intense flooding, plunging the earth into a period of intense, extreme cold. And geologists have known about that period. It's called the Younger Dryas. Uh, it began 12,800 years ago. They just didn't know why. Now we have the answer. We were hit by a comet. And my point is that to, to build the house of human history, when we do not have the foundations right, means it's very likely that our whole understanding of the origins of civilization is wrong. And that's what's happened. Historians and archaeologists have erected this edifice, which is the, supposedly our story of our past, but it is based on completely false foundations. And until we take those foundations into account, that the Earth passed through this gigantic cataclysm, not 65 million years ago, but just 12,800 years ago, uh, we can never really get to grips uh, with the story of ourselves. So it's this new evidence on, on a terrible cosmic disaster that occurred 12,800 years ago, and that ushered in the Younger Dryas, and that lasted until 11,600 years ago, when the Earth began to warm up again. Uh, it's this, this new evidence that is, that is of crucial importance in the story that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm telling. And it's not just a story about the past, because the compelling evidence shows, and, and this, is, this is a difficult subject to talk about, but I feel obliged to do so, that fragments of that original giant comet are still in orbit, and that the Earth passes through the orbital path of those fragments twice a year. We know it as the torrid meteor shower. We see these pretty Halloween fireworks in late October and early November as the meteors come winging in. Uh, but what's not been understood clearly until now is that the, that vast belt of meteors also contains some extremely large, extremely dangerous, and extremely dark objects, which we are crossing the path of twice a year. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the disaster that overtook our ancestors is a very real and present danger to us today. And it's a danger that we could do something about should we choose to do so. Graham, that is absolutely fascinating information. And your new book will be available in print uh, later this year, is that correct? Well, yeah, well, certainly the UK edition will be published on the 10th of September by Hodder and Stoughton in the UK. St. Martin's Press are publishing the US edition. They may, be a, they may be a little bit slower on the production. It's not clear to me yet. They might need a little more time. It could be later in 2000. And 15, or even very early 2016, that it comes out in the in the U.S. That's a matter that's uh, that's out of my hands. It's in the production department of the of the publishers. But in Britain, we're publishing on the on the 10th of September. You know, it's not just the cataclysmic uh, evidence. The other uh, issues of great importance. I mean, I mean, I could touch on a hundred issues, but let's touch on a couple more. Uh, one uh, one of them is this extraordinary archaeological site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. Uh, which I'm sure you've heard of and your listeners will have heard of. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is single-handedly rewriting human history uh, because here we have a gigantic series of stone circles uh, that, were, that began to be created 11,600 years ago. Now, that's a very mysterious for two reasons. Very mysterious, firstly, because 11,600 years ago is exactly the moment that that cataclysm called the Younger Dryas stopped and the Earth moved forward after more episodes of dramatic flooding. The Earth moved forwards into a new spring. 11,600 years ago is also significant because that's precisely the date that Plato gives us for the submergence and destruction of Atlantis. He said that Atlantis was submerged in a single terrible day and night um, 9,000 years before the time of the Greek lawmaker Solon, and Solon lived in 600 BC. So he was telling us that there was a global cataclysm in 9,600 BC, that's 11,600 years ago, and he was absolutely right, because the cataclysm first hit 12,800 years ago, and there was a second cataclysm 11,600 years ago. And then the world breathed a deep sigh and moved forwards onto a new story. And what I'm looking at is everything that happened before that new story began. 
Uh, and what I'm saying is that our understanding of history is fundamentally wrong, and Gobekli Tepe proves it because 11,600 years ago is supposed to be a period when our ancestors were just simple hunter-gatherers, supposedly incapable of large-scale architectural projects. And what we see at Gobekli Tepe is a giant architectural project. And in addition, mysteriously, those same people appear to quote-unquote invent agriculture at exactly the moment that they quote-unquote invent monumental architecture. I think a much more likely scenario is that we are looking at the work of the survivors of a lost civilization who brought with them those skills the skills to create monumental architecture, the skills to teach hunter-gatherers how to farm and grow crops. And that's what we see on the ground at Gobekli Tepe. So one thing Gobekli Tepe immediately means is no archaeologist can any longer uh, complain about the suggestion that the Great Sphinx of Giza might be 12,000 years old. Archaeologists used to complain about that because they said, show me the evidence of any other culture uh, that was creating monumental architecture 12,000 years ago. Well, we have it now. We have it in Gobekli Tepe. Those who made Gobekli Tepe could easily have made the Sphinx. And, uh, you know, this is changing the, the whole story. And then on the other side of the world, in Indonesia, we have the discovery uh, of a giant uh, pyramid. Previously, it was thought to be a hill uh, with an, a peculiar megalithic site on top of it. Uh, but a leading Indonesian geologist whose speci speciality is in, is in fact megathrust earthquakes um, became interested in this hill. He felt it had some odd geological features, and he conducted uh, remote sensing surveys on it using ground-penetrating radar and uh, seismic uh, tomography and electrical resistivity. And lo and behold, it turned out that that peculiar megalithic site was not sitting on top of a hill. It was sitting on top of a giant 300-foot-tall man-made pyramid, which has got at least three chambers deep inside it. And when they drilled down with core drilling uh, into the deeper layers and, and pulled up organic materials that they could date, they found that they were looking at dates going back into the last ice age, going back more than 20,000 years ago. So this incredibly interesting site also features in my book, and I've made a couple of lengthy research trips to Indonesia, and indeed not only to Gunung Padang, the name of that pyramid, but to um, a whole range of mysterious megalithic monuments all around the Indonesian islands, because the Indonesian islands were not islands during the Ice Age. They were part of a giant continent connected to Southeast Asia. And the sea level rise between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, submerged all that land and created the landscapes we see today. So we are living unknowingly amongst the ruins of a former world. And it's that former world that I am trying to bring back to memory uh, with this book. And it's called Magicians of the Gods because there are traditions all around the world of sages. Usually there's seven sages uh, who have supposedly magical powers, they're often called the magicians of the gods, who travel around the world spreading the gifts of civilization. And I think we're looking at the handiwork of the survivors of a lost civilization there who were seeking to recreate the former world that had been lost. Absolutely fascinating, Graham. And to our listeners, uh, Graham will be speaking on this topic at our Colorado Gathering, which is May 29th through June 1st, and we have a remarkable lineup of speakers for that event, including Graham, along with David Hatcher Childress, Dr. Robert Schock, John Major Jenkins, John Van Auken, and Dr. Charles Thomas Casey, who is the grandson of Edgar Casey. Now, Dr. Robert Schock also speaks a lot about this information, and David Hatcher Childress as well. And so there are a few people like yourself, Graham, that are really revealing shadow, that have credibility, and are starting to challenge the orthodox 
rigidity of uh, academia, and I really commend you for this because. Well, thank you, and and I'm glad that you know you're bringing a number of us together at this uh, at, at this event because you know we do all compare notes. Uh, for example, I was in Indonesia with Robert Schock last uh, last December, uh, in December 2013. I made a second, much more extensive visit there in 2014. But you know we are we are interested in the same. Uh, the same issues, and it takes teamwork, you know, to to break down a rigidly established paradigm. Uh, and you have to uh, you have to be rigorous, uh, you know. Uh, woolly, badly thought out ideas uh, do nobody any service. The ideas have to be really thought through, and they have to be supported and 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 documented and credible uh, if there's going to be a change in in perspective. And I think that desperately, urgently needs to be a change in perspective because we are uh, a, a civilization that has forgotten our own past. And we've also forgotten how fragile the edifice of civilization is. We all take it for granted that we've built up this huge technological culture uh, and we forget uh, that we live in a very unpredictable cosmic environment. Uh, and that everything we have created can be stripped away in a matter of days uh, if uh, we don't do something about it. Graham, you spoke about a comet crashing into North America. Is one of these speculated areas eastern Canada? Yes. Um, in fact, right across what were called the Cord Cordilleran and the Laurentide ice caps, which covered... Uh, the very large part of both Western and Eastern Canada um, completely covered them in ice that at its peak was a couple of miles deep, uh, and which was enormously stable. I mean, that ice was stable for the best part of 100,000 years. It reached its maximum extent 21,000 years ago. And it always has been a mystery why uh, it suddenly melted out. And, and the comet really provides the, the answer to that question. You can't get massive melting of ice without heat. Uh, and the, 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 there, were not, the, there were no resources in the Earth in northern Canada to create that heat. Uh, but a comet, fragments of a comet, one to two kilometers in diameter, coming in at 70 kilometers per second, uh, generate stunning amounts of heat, and, and you get a situation where just vast quantities of ice are liquidi liquidized immediately, and initially that sends up a huge plume into the upper atmosphere, and you get superheated ejecta from these, from these impacts shooting up into the sky and raining down all around the world. It's really stunning when you look at the science that's been done, and you look at the the kind of thumbprint of this of this impact, which is wide and deep across North America. North America absolutely was the epicenter of the disaster. But then it runs right across the Atlantic Ocean. It implicates Europe. It goes as far as the Middle East. It goes as far as Syria. Uh, it was just like a huge splatter of objects came down and hit the Earth, coming in on a trajectory that was started in the far northwest and fled progressively further south and east, and terminated, it seems, in the Middle East uh, with the final impacts uh, around uh, Syria and Turkey. Uh, and it's very interesting that it's in Turkey, very, very much a part of that area, where we see this mysterious site suddenly appearing uh, 11,600 years ago. Now, the interesting thing about Gobekli Tepe uh, is that it was deliberately buried by whoever built it. They built it. Uh, on a very large scale, uh, ground-penetrating radar at Gobekli Tepe. At the moment, we have six enclosures, four main enclosures with gigantic pillars, about 14 pillars in each case inside each enclosure. But still under the ground, we have 50 more enclosures, which have not been excavated yet, with hundreds of these huge megalithic pillars. And goodness knows what story they're going to have to tell or what the final dating on the site will be. But it's clear that all of them, the whole place, was deliberately, deliberately buried uh, around 10,200 years ago. Uh, deliberately buried, and it stayed buried until the 1990s, untouched by human hands for more than 10,000 years, like a time capsule. 
it leads you to wonder what else was covered that we have not yet uncovered. Well, you see, there's a huge excavation job still to be done. And at the moment, astonishingly, although this is the most important archaeological site in the world, the German Archaeological, Ex um, the German archaeological Institute, which has the excavation permit, is saying, well, we don't have any more money. We can't excavate more of this. We're just going to leave it. Uh, and to me, that is a terrible mistake because when you deliberately bury a place like this, you are actually putting a message in the bottle to the future. Uh, and, and you are inviting some future time to come and find you and, and learn the lessons that you have to teach. There is, um, there is I, I, I can't go into too much detail now. It's, it's all in the book, but there is a message in Gobekli Tepe. They are sending a message using astronomy forward to the future and very specifically to our time. It's very exactly spelled out in astronomical terms. They are talking to us, and uh, I think it's pretty clear what they're telling us about the nature of the universe in, in, in which we live. So I think it's really important that the rest of that site get, uh, does get excavated and that we, that we find out you know, what is what is going on there and, and why exactly it was buried in the way that it was. But we can be thankful that it was deliberately buried because that Absolutely. meant it was, it was never looted down the centuries. Back in the 50s, some American archaeologists came to the site and they saw these, they saw these very finely cut tops of pillars sticking out of the ground and they ignored them because they were looking for stuff from the Stone Age and they thought this was a Byzantine cemetery. They, the work was so good, you know, they thought it was medieval, not prehistoric. And uh, it wasn't until Klaus Schmidt, the late Klaus Schmidt, unfortunately, he, he died some months ago, the main excavator of the site, uh, went to the site uh, and realized that it was very odd and started to excavate, that he discovered that we're looking at just the most remarkable prehistoric site in the world. Uh, and there it lay for 10,000 years, untouched. As a result, we can have very reliable datings from it because the datings have not been contaminated by the intrusion of later organic material, which is a serious problem with other megalithic sites. And it raises the question that other megalithic sites around the world, for example, particularly the giant megalithic temples on the island of Malta, which look very like Gobekli Tepe, uh, it raises the possibility that we have misunderstood those sites, that we have given them falsely young dates because of later carbon material that was introduced to them, and that, in fact, they too may be ten to 12,000 years old. Amazing. I would like to encourage our listeners now, if you would like to pose a question, we have about 20 minutes left. If you'd like to pose a question to Graham, just use the uh, question tab that should be on the left-hand side of your screen. Just put your name, submit the questions, and we'll try to get to a, a few of your questions directly, directly to Graham. Now, Graham, you spoke earlier about seven... The seven sages. Seven uh, sages. The seven, they're often called the seven sages. In some traditions, they're called the seven magicians or the magicians of the gods. Uh, they're sometimes called the shining ones. Uh, they're sometimes called the mystery teachers of heaven. Uh, they go by they go by different names. Uh, it's intriguing that we have this uh, tradition in Mesopotamia, for example, of the seven sages. Uh, their leader is a, a being called Oannes, O A W N E S, uh, and they are often depicted as uh, hybrids of fish and human being. This seems very odd. Uh, but if you examine the reliefs closely, it's clear that you're looking at a human being who's dressed up in some kind of uniform or costume that has elements of the fish about it. There is a fish head, uh, headdress, and there is a fish tail, but then you see the legs and the arms of a human being uh, coming out uh, uh, underneath it. And they're called the Apkalu, and there are seven of these Apkalu, the seven, the seven sages of Mesopotamia. And then we go to ancient Egypt and we look at the extraordinary Edfu building texts from the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt where a body of very ancient texts written on animal skins that were falling to pieces were made permanent by copying selections from them onto the walls of the Temple of Edfu. And in the Edfu texts, we read of the destruction of the 
island of the primeval ones. It's, a, it's an incredible story of Atlantis sitting there on the Edfu building text and of how the land where the gods lived was destroyed and only a few survivors were left. And amongst them were seven sages who then traveled the world in ships uh, seeking to restart uh, civilization. We find exactly the same story in India with the seven rishis. It's uh, truly a global, uh, a global tradition. And when you have these these traditions in widely separated cultures all around the world, you have to consider that they they all go back to a remote common origin. Absolutely fascinating. And the methods that have been taught. To the, to the ancient people after the devolution, after the restart, the reboot. You've written in some of your information, Graham, the use of medicinal plants, the use of... Uh, definitely, def- definitely. There's no... And this is a, the second... Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give two talks at your event in Denver. Sure. And, and, and one talk will be... Uh, will be on all the latest information on the lost civilization. I'll be revealing their information that I've never revealed anywhere before. Uh, And secondly, uh, I will give a talk on the subject of psychedelics and civilization uh, because it's clear, uh, although we today have been taught to hate and fear these substances and to demonize them, that ancient civilizations used powerful psychedelic plant medicines in an extremely careful and responsible way uh, as a means of making contact with other realms and other levels of reality. And there is no great ancient civilization that didn't do this, whether you're looking at Corral in Peru or whether you're looking at ancient Egypt. Wherever you go in the world, any of the uh, American civilizations, you're looking at the use of psychoactive plants as a key and honored part of their civilization. It's not widely known, but the, uh, in ancient Greece, the heart, the beating heart of ancient Greece, the spiritual heart of ancient Greece was the temple of Eleusis, the ruins of which stand outside Athens uh, to this day. And what was celebrated there was called the Eleusinian Mysteries. The greatest minds of the ancient world, Plato, Socrates, Uh, went to Eleusis and underwent an experience that they described as utterly transforming and that they came out of the experience having lost their fear of death, having understood that death is not the end, uh, that death is just another staging post on our very long journey. And very important research has been done on the potion that was drunk by the pilgrims at Eleusis. And it is now absolutely clear that it was a psychedelic potion uh, related to LSD. Uh, So what was regarded as the heart of ancient Greek culture uh, was not the result of the rational problem-solving consciousness that we so admire today, but the result of visionary experiences. Well, visionary experience has been something that I was led to do. I a few years ago, wanted to fast, and so I did a series seven years in a row of a of a five day fast in the Lakota yeah. modality. Right. And uh, after three years, I did experience a what might be termed an out of body experience. I'm the first to tell people that it perhaps it was a hallucination, but it was well, real. It was you know, valid. the thing we call the thing we call hallucinations. That's that's part of the loaded language of our culture. Uh, our culture seeks to diminish certain experiences through through language. What an ancient civilization would have called that experience is a vision, is a visionary yes. experience, and they would have placed great value in it. Just as today we pour scorn on dreamers, you know, in ancient civilization, the dreamer was a dreaming was a valid means of gaining knowledge about the nature of reality, and not to be despised, but to be uh, admired and 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 appreciated. So there are actually uh, almost countless ways and means to get into an altered state of consciousness. Well, after that experience, I went to Bolivia and I experienced uh, what is termed the God Vine, the Ayahuasca, and it was yeah. an incredibly 
spiritual experience. It was deeply uh, spiritual experience. As you as you know, I've I've had something like sixty journeys with ayahuasca myself in the last ten years, and and um, I regard these as the most important experiences that I've ever had in my life. I feel that they have, they they these experiences have transformed me, and made what was a theoretical uh, notion before into a practical, firm reality for me. That that reality is deeply mysterious, and that with our with our material sight, we only see a tiny part of it. Uh, that there is a much larger reality surrounding us, and one of the things ayahuasca does is is allow you to peek uh, into that wider reality and get a sense of how awesome it is, and how everything that we do on this plane is impacted by and affected by realms beyond us, and also that we, by our own behavior, impact and affect those realms as well. As above, so below. We are in a a relationship with the unseen. And this is what shamanism is all about. It's about connecting to these unseen realms in a proactive way for the benefit of the human race. And you and I have spoken about this on a personal level, but my own experience was one of revealing on a very deep and personal level the mistakes that I was making, the flaws of my character. And I had a searing, a burning drive to be a better person. Absolutely. And, and so I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of labeling when it comes to these visionary experiences. A, a huge a huge amount. Our society, our society, we live in a deeply troubled society, and our deeply troubled society makes completely wrong judgments about what these experiences mean. Uh, these, these uh, as you rightly say, with, with ayahuasca, and what you're describing as your personal experience is in fact a universal experience of people who work with ayahuasca, that we get to see the pain and the hurt we've caused. And we get to see it from the other person's point of view. Uh, this is very rare opportunity to have in life. Uh, because, you know, we erect so many barriers, we constantly seek to justify and defend our own behavior. If we say a harsh word or, or the, think a cruel thought, you know, we, we, we kind of justify that to ourselves and persuade ourselves that it's okay. And what ayahuasca does is it just strips all that away ruthlessly, and it shows you, and it shows the impact that you've had and the pain and the hurt that, that, that you may have caused. And in so doing... It gives us a chance to change our behavior. We can't go back and rewrite the past. We can't change mistakes we made decades or, or weeks ago, but, but we don't have to repeat them. And uh, ayahuasca gives us that, that opportunity. It's a revelation, and that's why they call the plants uh, teachers in the Amazon. These, these are teachers. These are tough love that we're getting from these plants. And uh, it's a, to my mind, it's a vitally important experience. I'm not saying there aren't other ways to do it. There are. I understand that there's prejudice against using visionary plants. By all means, investigate meditation, fasting, uh, austerities. Uh, but a time-honored, efficient way to step outside of the material realm and see what we're really a part of a technology of shamanism that has been explored and developed for thousands and thousands of years is the use of the visionary plants, and they should be part of our uh, our kit, you know, for for becoming fully developed human beings. Absolutely, and, and as you say, there are, there are many roads to the same path. There are other lenses. I did do the fasting. I uh, I fasted, as I mentioned, seven years, five days at a time, right, and. It's a process that eventually got me there, but it was yeah. three years in before I had the vision. And when yeah. I went to Bolivia uh, at 17,000 feet elevation and I did the God Vine, uh, I had an intensified experience of that. I met what I would consider to be angelic beings, yeah. and I experienced what, uh, and I was raised as a Christian as uh, in the Baptist church in uh, Arkansas. My mm -hmm. family were all ministers and deacons, and I experienced what they might term the judgment, except that it was while I'm alive. I, yeah. exactly as you explained, saw everyone that I had ever hurt, and I went through it visually yeah. and 
and and ask for their forgiveness in what appeared to be real time. And yeah. everyone that had ever hurt me, I had to release that and let that go. And yeah. I was in exactly. Was, You're quite right. That's exactly what it's about. I was in that altered state for four hours, but it absolutely in linear time seemed like 40 years. And when I yeah. came back, I was so grateful to realize I'm still on the earth and I can yeah. I can apply these changes and I yeah. and it you can you me. can integrate the changes into your life. See, a lot of people looking at this, particularly those who haven't worked with ayahuasca before, uh, they will say, "Oh, there's something artificial about that. You should do the fasting for seven years. You should, you know, you should take the hard and difficult route." What they don't realize is that ayahuasca is a hard and difficult route. It's a very oh, hard and difficult route. And what's really hard is integrating the experiences that you've had into the subsequent course of your life. It's not a magic bullet to enlightenment. It is an opportunity to change your life. But the work remains something that we alone have to do. You know, it can't be, it's not, the work is not done for us by the plants. The plants simply open our eyes to the work that needs to be done. And that's when the work begins. Absolutely. Graham, we have one question and, and we're running short on time. I'd like to ask this question from one of our viewers. And she is asking about the situation uh, around the world now, the issues that we have in the Middle East, and what do you see as a possible way of settling these issues, and do you see that there will possibly be a resolution? We should deal with the things that we can control. Rather than worrying ourselves too much about trying to control the behavior of others, we should control our own behavior, first and foremost. If we come from a place of love, if we come from a place of care and responsibility, if we stop adding to the harm and misery in the world, even while others may continue to do so, we will have taken the right steps. I think at the moment policy is too much focused on stopping and changing others and on not thinking about our own behavior at all. And that's where we have to start because that's the one area that we do have control over, both as individuals and as societies. And to me, that's where it, where it comes from. At the moment, we live in a world that is governed by fear and hatred and suspicion. And we need to transform that into a world that is governed by love and courage and trust. Beautifully said. Graham, you and I once spoke about uh, the concept of the university of duality. If yeah, we are... that's what we live in. I've, I've often quoted you on that phrase. You're absolutely right. That's what we live in. We live in a university of duality. Duality is not all there is, but that's the teaching process that we get in this incarnation on this planet, the choice between dark and light, between good and evil, and we are defined by those choices, and we grow or shrink our souls by the choices we make. Well, we often say that the curriculum of the University of Duality is a doctor called Cause and Effect, and it's a doctor that makes house calls. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> nicely put. Think, you know, in an interesting way, organized religion can be a wolf in sheep's clothing because that duality side comes in. Nothing uh, more horrific than the Inquisition, and to this day, it is um, it is the mindless following of organized religion, which is which is at the heart of many of the problems in the world today. I don't care which religion it is; it's the mindless following of those religions. The fact that. The fact that a human being is born into a particular culture or religion doesn't mean we have to accept all of that. We can make choices. We can change things that aren't good. And, and so much harm is being done. So it's important to look not at what organizations and the large religions are all organizations. It's important to look not at what they say, but what they actually do. There is a saying that the smartest thing the devil ever did was convince the world that he, that he doesn't exist. Well, I yeah. believe that the only devils are the ones that we, in duality, create, the, yeah. the thought forms, the negative waves. But it creeps in, in unseen ways. And so I think that love is the way. The Dalai, Dalai Lama made the statement that the truest of religions is the kind heart. 
And he, yeah. he has another quotation where he says, we don't need cathedrals, we just need an open heart and our knees to find church, to find absolutely. connection. Absol- absolutely right. Completely right. I think it was Socrates that said, my nationality is goodwill, and yeah. I am a citizen of the world. And so yeah. it is absolutely a time in which we really need to embrace the idea that hating war will not end war, that we will only end war by loving peace, because love is a far stronger energy than is exactly. hate. It's exactly. Far it's, it's, the only, it's the only energy that matters. It's the it's the key in the university of duality. Yeah. So, Graham, we'll leave a few closing comments for you, and we've taken 45 minutes of your time, and I sincerely appreciate what you are doing. I appreciate your time. Your life is an inspiration. You truly are an honest, open person with a brilliant intellect, and you have the ability to share ideas in a way that uh, is unlike any other person, and you are making a difference on the earth. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you for saying that. I feel very I feel very lucky, very privileged to have had the opportunity to live the life I've led um, and uh, to make my mistakes and to learn from them. Uh, I, feel, I feel blessed. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to your events and uh, meeting up with the other speakers there and, and all of the audience and getting involved in some good discussions. Well, this will be an absolutely wonderful grouping. I think that we have some of what I consider to be the highest vibrational people on the planet together. Charles Thomas Casey, who has a Ph.D. in psychology. Uh, He is the grandson of Edgar Casey. And Edgar Casey played a tremendous role in so many people's lives in the West. Fascinating figure. Fascinating figure, Edgar Casey. I've got huge respect for him. And, you know, we have Dr. Robert Schock, David Hatcher Childers, John Van Auken, John Major Jenkins, and an array of other people. And I think it will absolutely be a wonderful gathering. And we are so grateful that you're going to be a part of it, Grant. My pleasure. I'm hugely looking forward to it. Very much look forward to seeing you and Anne then and to having a great time. Thank you so very much. And I appreciate your time. And uh, be safe. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you all so very much.